Today I'm joined by DNA specialist, Kate Scott. Today, Kate's going to explain to us why it is that some people are lactose intolerant while others can drink gallons and gallons of milk, why some people can't eat bread, and some people, again, can eat a whole loaf and have no problem whatsoever, apart from, of course, making them very fast. I think you're going to be fascinated how a lot of this has to do with our DNA and our pre-wiring. And one thing I do promise you, you're going to find this a fascinating hour. So today's guest, Kate, is an expert on DNA, a subject I know very, very little about. Uh, and uh, I want to find out a lot today about DNA, uh, epigenetics, genetics, put it all together. Let's see how the conversation goes. How are you, Kate? I'm brilliant, thanks, Steve. Excellent. Now, from your accent, I can tell you, you're, you're not from the UK. No, I am, uh, I'm a Safa, and I'm sitting here in sunny South Africa at the moment. Fantastic. Fantastic. So tell me about uh, your company, DNA Pal, and tell me what we can learn from, from genetics. So DNA Pal is a relatively um, new one for us. I've been specializing in nutrigenomics for about five years. I've got a different um, DNA company as well that does a lot of white label for other um, companies that want to offer DNA testing. Um, DNA Pell was born when Vicky contacted me. So Vicky and I studied nutrition together in London, um, probably about six or seven years ago. And she knew that I'd been specializing in genetics, nutrigenomics for a while. And she said one day she was standing in Tesco and she felt like she just still had no idea the right things to buy. Um, as simple as that. And she thought, I wish I could just have something that came straight to my phone that would say, this is good for you, this is bad for you. Um, she'd done some DNA testing with a few other companies, and she just said she still felt, even though you know she had a bit of knowledge, she just still felt like she didn't have the, the, the tools or the, the knowledge to be able to help her make those simple kind of decisions. So she said, what do you think about having an app that people can upload their DNA data into that basically just gives them very, very simple guidance in layman's terms? Um, because it can, get, it can get quite complicated, especially just for the average person. Um, and I must say, I feel it's my life's mission to try and help people um, fully understand how their genes inform their health, how their diet and lifestyle can impact the way their genes work, both positively and negatively, and then help them to just make those simple tweaks that are important for them based on their DNA code that's going to help them achieve better health, better well-being, hopefully better longevity. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much how it came about. We've been working on it in the background for some years. Um, we launched the test kits themselves about six months ago, maybe slightly longer now. Um, and yes, I knew, so you've got one, and I'm hoping that after our chat, you'll be feeling very excited to hand your sample in. Absolutely brilliant. So let's go back to real basics for those that have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, yep. We have DNA in our body. That's that's what we inherit you know, when we're born. Uh, we can change it or we can put something on top called epigenetics, but let's not, we'll talk about that later on in the program. Talk us about exactly what DNA is and if we are predisposed in certain ways to more likely to get this or less likely to get this, how that then can help us decide what to put in the shopping basket and ultimately put onto our dinner plate. Yes, exactly. So when I go through results with clients, I try to simplify it as much as possible. And what I usually say is that essentially genes code for proteins and those proteins make enzymes. And all enzymes do is go on to break things down or build things up. And when, you have, when we look at your DNA code, so it's literally like a type of language. Um, when we look at certain points on particular genes, and I can see that Steve has this particular set of results for a particular gene, I know that that makes the gene either work too fast or too slow. It's as simple as that always. It, either a, a genetic variance or what we call a SNP has no effect at all 
or it makes a gene work too quickly or it makes it work too slowly. So, and that has a, that has a knock on effect on people's biochemistry, but that starts to get a bit complicated, but essentially that's what we're looking at. So in every single cell within the body, um, except for certain ones, but most of your cells contain within the nucleus, all of your DNA. And those are housed, housed on 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you have two copies of every gene. So chromosome one, for example, at the same point on chromosome one, you will have a specific gene on the one chromosome and a specific exact same gene on chromosome two. So when we're looking at those results, and you'll see when you, when you have an actual report, um, the result comes back and it's usually a combination of two letters, which will be CT or AG or AA or TT. Um, and that basically is just looking at what that gene is, what, what that outcome is on each of those genes. Does that make, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And then what you do then with that information, do you then sort of look back at other people's history of DNA and go, well, when they have that pair like that, that generally means this outcome or that outcome. And therefore, you know, you can then look at other, you know, use everybody else's benchmarks, say, right, people that have that set tend to go on to do this, make, you know, put on weight, lose weight, uh, more predisposed to certain cancers or diabetes. And therefore, because you are more slightly sort of in that direction, we recommend this diet. So, yes, exactly. Um, so what we do is we report, I mean, there are over 20,000 different genes and they're not all, um, having SNPs on those genes is not all, hasn't been completely researched yet. It's still a fairly young science. It's probably been around for just about 10 years, maybe just over 10 years now. So, and I can see as I look at research, I can see that the, the amount of available underlying research has grown massively over the last 10 years. But when I first started, there were only a, a sort of a handful of genes that had been very well researched to have specific outcomes. And in, in the field that, that we specialize in, which is nutrigenomics specifically, we're looking at genes that can be positively and negatively influenced by the diet itself. So when we decide to include a gene into our report, first of all, it's, it's, ha we know that it has an impact on something that affects health. So it's not only diet. We look at genes that affect digestion, sleep, stress, hormones, um, immune system, and then obviously looking at um, food intolerances. So th there's a vast amount of things that you can look at. And when we look at those SNPs, we then can see, okay, this person is more predisposed to type 2 diabetes, for example. But there's a reason. The underlying reason is the biochemistry. So it's not that because you're predisposed to that, it's too bad, and now we're telling you bad news. Actually, what we're trying to do is educate people to understand why they have that risk and to mitigate it. So some, some kind of easy examples would be lactose intolerance. So lactose intolerance actually is the norm. So it's really not normal for us to be drinking another animal's milk after infancy. Um, but because Caucasians have had dairy in their diets for so many years, we've actually evolved to be able to produce the, the enzyme lactase that breaks down the lactose in dairy um, into adulthood. So I see lactose intolerance quite often in African and Asian populations simply because they haven't had dairy in their diets for as long. So they, their genes haven't evolved to be able to deal with that lactose. Um, another one is predisposition to celiac disease, um, which is slightly different to gluten sensitivity. Celiac disease um, is something that never goes away, whereas gluten sensitivity is something that you could, if you avoided gluten for a, a long period of time, actually get rid of. Um, trying to think of other ones that are just very straightforward examples. Um, 
So we look at certain uh, liver pathways that affect the ability to deal with toxins. Um, I mean, gosh, it's, it's so vast. Uh, but essentially what we want to do is pick out those risk factors and then give people the tools to be able to mitigate those risks. Got it. So let me, I'll, I'll play slightly devil's advocate because, because I think you've got the answer. So we know for a fact that diabetes, you know, was, it was around just before the Second World War, then it sort of went away when the food was in restrict, restricted. Um, and then obviously it's come back and now it's growing out of proportion. It's going crazy, more and more people getting it. So in, in, one, in one sense, that can't be all about genetics because, you know, the, the rise is so rapid that, that that would kind of be impossible. A bit like people saying, I'm so worried about cancer. My parents have had cancer uh, and I've heard it's all about genetics. I say, well, it can't all be about genetics because, you know, you go back 100 years, it was one in 20. Now in the UK, sadly, according to cancer research, one in two people will get it. Well, if you do the maths, that's impossible to all be about genetics. But what you're saying, I think, is that an element of it can be genetics. And the way I always say, it, and correct me if you think this is a bit of a silly analogy, but I go, look, okay, and this is fact, you know, so my, my dad's got diabetes, my mom's got Alzheimer's, maybe I'm slightly more at risk. But it's a bit like a gun. And with that gun, maybe my trigger's a little bit more loaded because maybe something in my DNA says I'm slightly more likely to get it than maybe the average person or somebody where their parents hasn't. But something still has to pull the trigger to, to make it happen. And if we can prevent the trigger by being pulled because we've got the knowledge from people like yourselves about our DNA, we take a little bit more precaution, we eat more of the right things, we get the right amount of sleep, exercise and so on, then by doing all those things with the knowledge that we might be slightly more predisposed to it, we can take action. Is, is that, I threw a lot at you, sorry, sorry but. Um... <laughs> no, but that's it, you've got it, it's 100% right. So your DNA sets the scene and it gives you the baseline for what your predispositions are likely to be. And obviously having certain things in your family, so if you say, you know, that you're, th it, there's Alzheimer's and there's risk of diabetes in your family, um, there's always two factors there. So number one, obviously the genetics are passed down through families, but often so is diet and lifestyle because, you know, you're growing up in that household, you're eating the same foods, um, you have the same understanding and knowledge around those things. So it's once, yeah, so I, I mean, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, complete sense, complete, yeah. complete sense, yeah. Okay, so um, give me some examples then of, uh, you've analysed somebody's data. I'm going to send mine in to you very, very shortly. Uh, you've analysed somebody's data. And then what might the recommendations be? Give me some, 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 some scenarios. Um, so, when it, so let's say there's certain ones that are very relatable. There's a, there's a, G, a liver pathway that means that pe certain people don't break down caffeine as well as others. So that's something that you probably already know because you'd know if you have a cup of coffee and then you have a second one, it doesn't make you feel great. Maybe you get more jittery, but that is very much genetically determined. So if you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, obviously the effect of caffeine, it, caffeine's gonna hang around for a bit longer than people who are fast metabolizers. So it's going to end up having more negative impact um, in terms of stress or sleep or just feeling pretty poorly. Um, other things that can be affected are the way that you absorb particular nutrients. Um, so B12, uh, the way that you convert specific nutrients. Uh, so vitamin B A, uh, so vitamin A rather. Um, so there's a, there's a gene that makes people less able to convert pre-vitamin A into pro-vitamin A, which means that actually those people are, are, do less well on a purely vegetarian or vegan diet because they can't actually get the active form of vitamin A, which comes from animal products. Okay, so again, what I think you're saying is we have, for example, in the UK, NRVs, in America, they have RDAs, which is you need this amount of each nutrient, each vitamin every single day. But that's obviously across an average population. It's all, I always say it's a bit like a minimum wage, it's not the optimum. But we also know from a lot of research, some people process vitamin B12 better than others. So we on a sort of a blank page go, look, you need probably 10 times 
everybody, but certainly as you get older, what they say you need for B12, that's what we believe. But actually it varies from individuals and you can actually measure that. So you can almost tailor the supplementation and, and the diet to that individual's ability to absorb those particular nutrients. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Completely. So I think, you know, the, the DNA only really gives one part of the picture. So we're looking at predispositions and ability to convert things. I generally, in an ideal world, it would then be great to be able to blood test people to see whether those are manifesting. So if somebody shows that they're likely to not be able to absorb B12 and they can't convert vitamin A very well, ideally it would be great to be able to then blood test them and see what their actual levels are. But you're completely correct when you say the RDAs that are set by in various countries basically just give you the, the absolute minimum level to avoid illness. That doesn't mean that those are optimal levels at all. So I think I'm getting this a little bit now. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, so uh, I can have coffee right up till almost I go to bed and my kids think I'm crazy, but I know it doesn't affect my sleep. Whereas my poor wife, she, who loves coffee, but she has it in the afternoon at all. By the time she goes to bed, she just doesn't get a good night's sleep. And you're saying that's got something to do with the genes. And I guess by, by learning that, that kind of explains to herself why that happens. Yes, absolutely. So it's actually based on two different genes. There's the first gene that I mentioned that makes people either a fast or slow metabolizer of caffeine through the liver. But then there's actually a second gene that affects the ability or it, it affects the way that, that caffeine can impact on sleep. So you could actually have a situation where somebody is a fast caffeine metabolizer but if they have a cup of coffee, say they want to have a little shot of espresso after dinner, they, they might actually then struggle to sleep, whereas you can have a slow caffeine metabolizer who can have that same shot of espresso after dinner and actually go to sleep fine. So that seems a contradiction, but it's because it's actually working in two different ways. Got it. So I was so skeptical about this whole thing about testing DNA, and I'll tell you why, because I always say it's all right because I think stress is probably one of the most important things in life. If people are too stressed, I, I, when I speak to cardiologists, uh, cancer experts, no matter who I'm speaking to, I say, give them the five ways to avoid whatever their specialist is, you know, heart disease, cancer, strokes, diabetes. And they all put stress in, in the top five, some at the very, very top. So I always go, well, the problem with DNA testing is all you're going to do is scare the crap out of everybody and actually just make matters worse. But I think what you're saying is... We're not going to go and tell you whether you're more predisposed to cancer, even though that you probably could from all these tests. You're looking at things where you can do actionable outcomes and therefore give people a list of things to try. And also kind of explains to people why you're not a freak. You know, the fact you can't have a coffee at 11 o'clock at night, it's just your DNA. You know, don't keep saying, well, I'm going to keep trying, 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 because my friend can do it. It just doesn't fit your, your, your DNA profile. And here, But here's all the things you can action to make... I guess, better outcomes. Yes, that's exactly it. So I'd say our focus is very much on a positive spin. We try to show the, the exact steps you can take to make sure that even though you might have that predisposition, you're not going to end up with that condition. It's not all about conditions. We don't actually report on any serious um, genetic conditions. So obviously there are things where if you have a gene, you are very likely to end up with a specific condition. Um, those things can't be influenced through nutrition or diet lifestyle changes. So we don't, that's not within our remit. We only look at things where there's a predisposition and you can actually manage that predisposition by making better choices. So an example is there's a gene called APOE, which is known to be one of the, the biggest risk factors in developing, genetic risk factors, sorry, in developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, and people are, have been quite terrified to, to learn certain things. So it kind of, if, if I use the example of my mum, you know, so my family have heard me banging on about the DNA testing for years. And only now that it's starting to get a bit of media attention, are they coming back to ask me, so, you know, maybe I will take it. In the beginning, my mum said 100% for exactly what you said that she didn't want to take it because she didn't want to hear the news 
that she had a risk of something because very much if it's in your mind almost you can you can get so stressed about it that you actually might manifest it and i've tried over the years to say but that's that's not how that's not our focus at all um what we want to do is show you why there's a risk and the fact that it is very avoidable so even that apoe gene it works on clearing out certain types of fatty deposits and if you can get that under control you actually bring down your risk hugely so um when I was talking to your colleague the other week, you know, you, you, it, it, it's done by a, not blood test, but via a swab. I've got one in there, which I'm, I'm going to do this week. <laughs> I've just, again, I've been having that conversation myself that your mother was having. Is, do I really want to know? Because I know I eat healthily anyway, and I know I exercise. Is there anything else I could do? But actually, I'm thinking, well, may, maybe there's some little tweaks that, that may help. Um, so I'm going to do the swab. Um, and then, but your colleague was saying there's like 700 different things you could respond on but you're only going to respond on sort of 60 or 70 of those where you can take action to improve your outcomes. Yes. So when we test you, we're looking at over 700,000 different data points, let's say, on the genes. But because only a handful of those have been properly researched and are ones that fall within our remit of being able to be influenced by diet and lifestyle. So, by the way, we kind of, in, earlier in our conversation, we touched on uh, nutrigenomics and epigenetics. So, essentially, they, those are, they sound like mind-boggling terms, but to make that a bit more simplified, nutrigenomics looks at the influence that your diet and lifestyle, and when I say diet and lifestyle, I include in lifestyle your environment, have on the way that your genes operate. So you can never change your actual DNA code. So as I said, that's kind of like a hard-coded language. But what you can influence is the way that those genes behave. So in the beginning when I explained how those SNPs can make genes either work too slowly or too quickly, what bringing in positive diet and lifestyle changes can do is make genes that work too, or slow down genes that work too quickly and speed up genes that work too slowly. Um, or if you're looking in the case of lactose intolerance, for example, you know that because the body doesn't have the ability to break that down very well, by avoiding lactose completely, you're going to be avoiding all of the negative symptoms that might be you know, uh, flowing on from that. And often people don't realize. So I had a client recently last week who he's actually my neighbor. So he's, he's, Af he's African. And I'd said to him for, for months, I know that you're going to be lactose intolerant. So, and he sort of said, yeah, okay, sure. But then we did, then we actually did a test for him. He got the results. He saw it in black and white. And now, from last week, he's completely cut out lactose. So he always suffered with asthma. And I said to him, I, I suspect that it's the lactose that's causing your asthma. So he's only been off it for a week. First of all, one, one thing to note is I always find when people actually see things in black and white, they're far more likely to take action. Um, then, since cutting out lactose for the week, already he's noticed that he's he hasn't needed his ventilator once wow that's so encouraging so encouraging what about things like ibs you know uh irritable, irritable bowel, bowel syndrome where you know often people just can't identify you know what the problem is would, would taking a dna test potentially help identify what it is that's causing the problem so uh, yes and no, because it depends what is driving that IBS, and it can be quite multifactorial. But certainly, DNA will show predispositions to having intolerances to certain things that would be my first port of call in terms of taking those out of the diet. So specifically, gluten and dairy. Um, and I think some people would argue, well, wouldn't you take those out anyway? Um, because those are very common irritants. Um, but I would say, wouldn't you rather know whether those are actual problems for you? 
because it can be quite restrictive having to take a lot of things out of the diet. Um, and this is, I kind of alluded to earlier that there's a difference between being actually intolerant and developing a sensitivity to certain foods. So intolerances are things that you're born with. So that's genetic and the, those will flag up as a proper IgE immune reaction. Um, generally, you'll never be able to tolerate that specific food in your lifetime. Sensitivities develop over time and are usually as a result of something called leaky gut. So leaky gut's not the official term, it's actually called intest intestinal permeability. Um, but essentially what happens is within the digestive system, um, you have something called tight junctures, which should be you know, firmly together like that. Throughout our lives, um, a lot of things can cause those tight junctures to start to come apart. So if you imagine that your digestive system is really the main barrier between you and the outside world. Um, so as you're taking things in, and if your junctures start to become loose, and that can be as a result of stress, um, certain foods that are irritants, um, pain medication or certain medications, alcohol, there are quite a few things that can cause leaky gut. Um, and as you eat foods that you, you aren't actually intolerant to, they start to pass through those bigger gaps and into the bloodstream. And then the immune system, which is wired to detect things that shouldn't be there, start to notice these bigger particles and then tag them up as, as a problem. So let's say you, you don't have an issue with eggs, but you eat a lot of them. And at some point you develop leaky gut and you're eating eggs as normal. And then suddenly two, two weeks, three weeks later, you start to notice some types of symptoms. So, and that can be anything from digestive symptoms all the way to allergy type things. So itchy skin can be eczema, all sorts of things that people don't even realize. Um, even painful joints, because obviously this is causing inflammation and it's causing the immune system to flag things up erroneously. Um, so that's, that's the difference between a sensitivity, a developed sensitivity and an actual intolerance. So the thing about sensitivities is that you can actually reprogram the immune system to stop flagging those things up if you avoid them for long enough and you heal that leaky gut. So it takes quite a bit of discipline um, and I would say always should be done with a therapist, but in, within six weeks or so, you could actually be able to reintroduce those types of foods back into your diet quite normally. That's so interesting. Can the opposite happen? And I'll tell you why. Uh, since going primal, I've cut out bread absolutely completely. I've probably gone, uh, I mean, probably last Christmas, I was a bit naughty and had a little cheap with the pizza. Um, but I've probably gone six months, seven months without a single bit of bread in any shape or form till a few days ago where I had too many glasses of wine and there was some pizza in the house because one of my children were naughty. We have this horrible system where you can have any food delivered any time of the day from any takeaway. It's just the most crazy invention in the human race. Anyway, I found myself having a couple of slices of pizza. The next day, I felt absolutely bloated and terrible. And I said to my kids, I wonder if, because I was never gluten intolerant before, I wonder if I've been off bread for so long now that my system just goes, hey, hey what on earth are you doing? So I wonder if the opposite could also be true. I think, I think a few possibilities. So I've noticed that the, the cleaner you get, uh, the healthier your diet gets, the more sensitive you become to crappy foods. Um, I've seen that with lots of things. So f foods that when, you know, when you're not following a healthy diet, things that wouldn't have been a problem for you, all of a sudden after being on a strict program can really start to not sit well. Um, and that even goes for things like red meat. So if somebody takes red meat out of their diet, we already know that that's quite hard to digest. But if the system's not used to it, and after six months or so, somebody you know went and then had a, a a roast lamb or something that really can start to cause some some awful digestive 
kind of horrible symptoms. Um, so I think that's what happens. I think the system becomes so clean and pure almost that anything that's not great, because even people who aren't really intolerant or sensitive to gluten um, can have a problem because gluten is actually a known irritant. Yeah, I say to people that have got uh, you know, gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance, so you're the lucky ones. <laughs> you know, it's just your body's got a better defense system than those that haven't got it because it's saying, hey, we're not, just as you said earlier, we're not designed to drink milk from a cow. I mean, you just follow the no. logic. You know? It's just we're not. No. And, uh, and, and therefore, you're, maybe, maybe they're the lucky ones that have the intolerances. Yes, I think people see it as a disadvantage, but actually if you think that these are not foods that are actually particularly nutritious, although milk has always been touted as the best you know, source of calcium, they're not actually foods that we need. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, so true. So, so true. Now, talk to me, I, I mentioned the word epigenetics, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but epigenetics, that's the bit on top of your DNA, is it, that, that, uh, that, that can alter or make that DNA become active or whatever you're disposed to active. Epigenetics, is that your environment, your lifestyle that sits on top of your sort of pre-programmed DNA? Yes, sorry, so I am prone to a tangent. I was on that, was on that trajectory. So um, what I was saying about nutrigenomics is that that's the interaction of your diet and lifestyle and environment on DNA and vice versa, how they affect one another. Um, and that in itself is a branch of epigenetics. So when you're making a choice to take out lactose because you're lactose intolerant or cut down or remove caffeine because you don't, you don't break it down very well and it's having a bad impact on your stress levels and your sleep, um, or whatever else it might be that you, you've made that choice because you've seen that there's an impact, that is epigenetics. So what you're doing is making choices that actually affect your genes positively and will eventually end up having positive outcomes on your health. Brilliant. In fact, earlier on, I was a bit skeptical when you said... Uh doing a DNA test, find out more about your genes, that can actually affect your sleep in a positive way. But now I think you've just answered my skepticism because what you've said is uh, by looking at certain genes, certain DNA, you can work out what causes you stress. And of course, stress is one of the biggest things that prevents people getting a good night's sleep. And is that, is that one of the ways that you can help people get a good night's sleep? Absolutely. It's one of, the, it's one of those things where... Um, you know, we, we look at the body and the genes and a person's environment and diet as all as one kind of dynamic organism and all those things impact each other in, you know, in various ways. So it can, it can be quite complicated, but essentially we're looking at pathways. But other ways that, that DNA can directly impact sleep, um, for example, one of the genes that we report on in, our, in the, the sleep pillar of our report is the, the melatonin receptor. So now that's not the ability to produce melatonin, which has its own pathway. You know, that, that means you're having to eat enough tryptophan in the first place to be converted into serotonin, which then becomes melatonin. But let's, let's assume that you're making enough melatonin. There's a gene that controls the ability for your brain to receive that melatonin and for you to start to get the signal to become sleepy. So some people who have a SNP on that specific gene have a, a receptor that's a little bit deaf. That's usually how I like to explain it. Um, it will eventually get the signal of melatonin. You won't never sleep, but it's not as receptive as people who don't have the SNP on that particular gene. And so the, the recommendations we would give to people who struggle with that is to have a proper bedtime routine and completely avoid all the blue light in the evening. So tablets, screens, watching exciting things on Netflix, um, you know, really creating that that kind of that routine that your brain knows okay we're winding down the melatonin's getting through even though it's slower and that's going to help people who have that problem to achieve better more restful sleep 
I'm loving and this. As, I'm loving this because yeah. it's explaining so many things to me. So uh, you know, we know that you know, I've written in my, I think all my books. Uh, you know, that hour before bed. You know, all the blue screens have got to go off. Kids. Uh, a doctor, uh, Professor Robert Lustig says. In fact, there was research now that says children that sleep with their mobile in their bedroom get 25 minutes a night less sleep just because of the. the, the yeah. I don't know for whatever reason, but you know, limit, limit, limit your screen time before you go to bed. We tell to everybody. But you're saying, I think, that based on your own genes and your DNA, some people it might it should be two hours, maybe some people it should be half an hour. And that's why maybe some people can, you know, watch TV right to the last minute and still get a good night's sleep. And others, they just they, 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 they seem to be wired for hours and hours. And just by looking at your DNA, it kind of explains to you the person that you, you know, the bits that are there that are pre-programmed to help you then make changes to suit your pre-programming. Yes. And let's be honest, it wouldn't, you know, we would never recommend to anybody that they should be on their phone before sleep. But the genetics shows why some people get more impacted than others. And that one example can be extrapolated through quite a few other examples. It's why, you know, some people, as you say, some people can have a cup of coffee at night and go straight to sleep and, and others can't. So there are a lot of reasons like that where somebody can say, but I do that all the time and I don't get affected. Um, but why, you know, that person did it once and they feel terrible. So, and there, there are lots of different reasons there. So we're looking at a, a bottom-up approach. So why the genes impact a person like that. But then, of course, we know that if that person then hasn't gotten a good night's sleep, that goes on to affect their stress levels, um, certain hormones, so, you know, at their concentration, making them want to reach for more sugary snacks during the day, drink more caffeine, which then again feeds into not being able to sleep properly again, becomes a vicious cycle. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on the show today. Thank you uh, for dining in all the way from South Africa. Uh, we'll put a link up to DNA Pal. And uh, just, again, a huge, huge thank you. My pleasure. It's been great fun. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.